that elections have consequences, and there were great messages sent in this last election, and the people expect us to let them know that we get it and that there aren't any excuses in the process. I yield the floor. Mr. President. Senator from a great state of Montana. Thank you, Mr. President. I rise today in support of the Troop, Troop Pay Protection Act measure. It's one of the bipartisan pieces of a very partisan puzzle, and it is common sense. We owe it to our nation's troops from suffering the consequences if the House of Representatives shuts down this government. If we don't pass this measure while we still have time, our troops will continue to serve us overseas. Uh, they will always be essential to the United States. But if the government shuts down, our troops won't get paid. That's unacceptable. America's troops are America's heroes. They're serving us in difficult, dirty, dangerous conditions. They're away from their families, away from their homes and their communities. They're risking their lives to answer the call of duty. Yet they still have financial responsibilities that we all have here at home. They have mortgages to pay and car payments to make. They have families to take care of. We do our service men and women right by passing this bill. It simply says if there's a shutdown, don't make our troops pay the price for the failures of a few extremists in Washington, D.C. Make sure their paychecks come in on time. Delayed pay is the last thing the members of our military and their families should be burdened with. I know there's talk that the House is trying to push through something similar in an effort to cover some bases, but their plan isn't straightforward as this bipartisan bill. Their plan to hold our troops harmless is part of a week-long spending measure loaded up with a bunch of extreme prov provisions that this country cannot afford. And because it's part of a temporary bill, if it is passed, we'll be right back here making the same argument next week. Mr. President, I am always amazed how dysfunctional this process can be. I've been reminded of that a lot this week. Here's an opportunity to throw some common sense back into the mix. I ask my colleagues to pass this measure and pass it now. And with that, I yield the floor. Mr. President. Senator from the great state of Arkansas. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, one thing I would like to say is that I don't want to shut down, and I don't like where we are tonight, the fact that we're here and our backs are against the wall on a shutdown, and I think that we collectively have done a great disservice to the American people. I think they deserve better than what they're getting right now from Congress. And um, I know the people that I represent, uh, they're hardworking, they're very sensible, kind of like the folks from your hardworking, very sensible state, but they're also very patriotic. And they believe in this country, and they believe in the values and the things that make this country great. And they understand, the people of Arkansas understand that right now we have 90,000 troops in Afghanistan and we have more than 45,000 in Iraq. And they're there to serve this country and to serve the interests of this country. And I can take something local like the Little Rock Air Force Base and I can say that we have more than 5,600 airmen that are and, and about 640 civilian employees that could be affected in one way or another by this shutdown. About 2,000 employees of the Arkansas National Guard will be affected. It's 956 guardsmen on active duty would continue to work without pay. 233 Arkansas Army Reservists are uh, deployed overseas, including uh, 23 that are designated for Libya. So the people in my state do not want to see the military affected in any way by the partisan gamesmanship that you see here in Washington. In fact, I would add a note to that. I'd say it's unconscionable that we should add stress to our military families right now, especially for those who are deployed. It's just really unconscionable that we would do that. 
under the circumstances that we find ourselves in tonight. So let me talk about two leaders who've really stepped up to try to solve this problem and try to cut through all the mess that you see in Washington, try to cut through the politics as usual. That'd be Senator Hutchison from Texas and Senator Casey from Pennsylvania. Both of them have worked in a very bipartisan way, as my colleague from Montana just mentioned a moment ago, in a very bipartisan way to craft some legislation uh, that would make sure one way or the other, make sure one way or the other, that uh, our troops get paid on time without any disruption. Mr. President, we've all heard the word or the phrase hard-earned pay. Well, how does it get any harder earned than by serving in combat for your country? Again, I, it's hard for me to understand how we are here talking about this tonight and haven't already addressed it. So I think that whatever bill is offered, and whether it's a bipartisan bill, which I hope it is bipartisan, whatever gets offered, uh, and I'm not quite sure at the moment who's going to be the lead sponsor. Like I said, I've looked at the legislation offered by the two senators I mentioned before, but who, however it comes down, and sometimes here in the Senate, things can change on you for various reasons, but however it comes down, I hope that we will not only consider, but we will pass legislation that will protect our active duty men and women and our reserve component and the Coast Guard. We can't forget the Coast Guard. A lot of times they're an afterthought, but certainly they do great things and they serve our country just like everybody else and they, they deserve to be included in this. And also, we need to give the Secretary of Defense the discretion so that he can run his department in a way that won't weaken us. He, he needs that discretion, whatever that may mean. Again, we may have some differences on the details, and one senator may think one thing one than another, but bottom line, we need to give him enough discretion to make sure that during this time where uh, we may have to go through a shutdown, I certainly hope we don't, but if we go through a shutdown, I want to make sure that nothing in that shutdown ends up weakening our ability to perform the missions we need to perform and to put our, our troops in any additional danger more than what they are right now. Um, in, in conclusion, let me just offer an observation. I have witnessed in the last few weeks, on, on more occasions than I can count, senators and congressmen, and I've even witnessed, you know, the, the blogosphere, the commentators, the talking heads, the so-called experts doing exactly what, in my view, is wrong with Washington. That is, they're playing the blame game. Man, they, they hold a press conference, they're pointing fingers at everybody else but themselves. And it's going on all over the place. So I'm not singling any one person out or any one party out, but I've, I, we've seen that way too much. And the truth is, the, the folks that's hurting are the American people. It, our, our democracy is designed in such a way, and it has a tracker record, but we all know it'll work, and it'll work great, and it'll get the job done. And we represent people, and we can get in here and debate hard and fight hard and have our differences, but at the end of the process, we have votes, we make decisions, and then we move on. And right now, for whatever reason, again, this is a problem in both chambers. It's not here in the Senate. It's not just one party that's at fault. For whatever reason, we're seeing a breakdown in the system. That's not good for the country, and it's not good for, certainly, tonight, we're talking about our troops. It's certainly not good for them. But, Mr. President, I could easily spend the next 10 minutes at, at my desk here blaming the Republicans for where we are tonight. You know, I know that they've said we hadn't passed anything. That's not true. Listen, we, we passed extensions six times to keep the government running. Six times we've passed extensions. And I, oh, but, but I don't want to get into the, all that because, again, I could spend 10 minutes talking about the, what, how awful and terrible the Republicans are. Then I could turn right back around and spend the next 10 minutes talking about how terrible the Democrats are. Because honestly, and if people would be honest with the American people, 
both are to blame. I cannot stand here in good conscience and blame just one person or one party. The fault lies with all of us. And to see that right now, here we are, because of the partisan bickering, because of the breakdown, here we are, quite frankly, at least my concern would be, using our military as pawns in this budget fight. Again, it's something that we should never do. We're not, we're not helping anyone. This is not good government. Uh, we're, we're not doing our citizens and our people any favors with doing this. So what I would hope, Mr. President, I would hope that tonight, before we go out of here, that we would pass something. Again, whatever bill it is, I'm, I'm not hung up on who has to be the lead sponsor or what the number of that bill has to be. I hope we will pass something in some way that will uh, make sure that our troops get paid on time and that it takes care of our active duty, the Reserve and the uh, Coast Guard, and it also uh, gives the Secretary of Defense enough discretion to run his department like it needs to be run. And I think under the circumstances that is not even close to too much to ask. I think that is perfectly within the bounds of reason, and I would hope and pray that tonight before we leave here we could all agree to do that. By the way, I think if we did put that on the floor and we didn't load it up with lots of agenda items, I think we'd put that on the floor in a, in a clean fashion. I think it would sail out of here probably unanimously. And I think, I can't speak for the House, but my guess is uh, we would see the same result down there. So, Mr. President, I want to thank you and the Chamber for its time. And my understanding is we have other senators that may be on the way to speak. So I would ask unanimous consent that the period for morning business uh, for debate uh, only be extended in until 9 p.m. with senators permitted to speak for up to 10 minutes each with the majority leader to be recognized at 9 p.m. Without objection. And Mr. President, while we're waiting other senators, I would suggest the absence of a quorum. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Okonkwo.
unanimous consent that further proceedings in the quorum call be dispensed with. Without objection. Thank you, Mr. President. Throughout uh, this day, uh, a lot of our constituents back home have been watching the debate, and uh, I wonder maybe if they're a little frustrated. I talked early this morning about throwing rotten apples at each other, and there's been a lot of that here today. I'm not going to do that tonight. I suggested this morning that uh, one of the things we could do while we are waiting to see whether or not an agreement can be reached to fund the government through the end of this fiscal year was to try to shed some light on the process, which uh, uh, undoubtedly is a bit confusing to people. What exactly is it that we're arguing about? How did we get here and what do we have in the future? And we talked a little bit this morning about the fact that what we are talking about today and hoping to achieve tonight is <clears throat> an agreement that would determine how much we will spend to fund the federal government for the next approximately six months through the end of September, which is the end of the fiscal year that begins each October 1st. Um, that is an important proposition. Uh, it's important enough that there's been a lot of very difficult debate about that, as people have seen over the last several days and certainly today. Uh, it appears that there is still a, a bit of a deadlock on exactly how much money should be saved in the last six months of this fiscal year. But when we've concluded this, um, this particular debate and determined how much we're going to spend to fund the government through the end of September, we're going to turn to some even more important issues, and they are really going to require our concentration are reaching across the aisle to talk to each other, to the other body, both members, both bodies of the Congress to speak to the President. We're really going to have to listen to the American people and try to reach uh, important understandings then, because then we're talking about funding the government for the entire fiscal year for 2012, and also trying to figure out what to do with the President's request to extend the debt ceiling. And as I mentioned this morning briefly, extending the debt ceiling is a little bit like going to your credit card company and saying, all right, I've used up all of my available credit, but I want to buy something else. Will you let me spend a little bit more on the credit card? And that's what the President has asked Congress to do, to extend the debt ceiling. We'll have a robust debate about that. But let me just see if I can put, put what we're doing here in this context. We will at least for the year 2011, which we're halfway through, we will have reduced spending by a pretty dramatic amount, somewhere in the neighborhood of 40 to 50 billion dollars. Don't know exactly how much until we're all done. But when you add that to what we call around here the baseline and multiply it times 10 years, you get substantial savings just on the 10 billion dollars that we saved uh, earlier this month over. Ten years, that $10 billion equates to $140 billion saved over the 10-year period. So we are talking about substantial money here. But that probably pales in comparison to what we're going to need to save in the entire budget for the fiscal year 2012. And um, there's no shortage of uh, problems that, that, uh, that have uh, uh, attracted our attention. For example, the trillions of dollars in unfunded liabilities coming from the mandatory spending side of our ledger, in addition to the way that we're trying to save money just to keep the government running here. By mandatory, we mean the programs like Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, some veteran spending, and so on. I, I talked about the, uh, the uh, estimate of uh, hitting our, our debt limit. The Treasury Secretary estimates that we'll hit that debt limit, in other words, the amount that we borrowed on our credit card and can't exceed, that's the total amount of U.S. legal debt, no later than May 16th of this year. So May 16th, the President says we need to address the debt ceiling. Uh, if you're not keeping track, the current debt limit is about uh, $14.3 trillion. So we're going to be pressing up against $14.3 trillion, uh, and we're going to have to borrow more money if we're going to spend more in the next year. So Republicans offered a variety of ideas on this, and I just want to alert my colleagues to what some of these ideas are so we can begin thinking about them and uh, hopefully acting on them in the run-up to the debate about what to do about the debt ceiling. There's very little enthusiasm around here for increasing the debt ceiling if we don't also do something to constrain future spending, because we don't want to come up against a debt ceiling every few months or years. 
we need to decide that that's going to be it. We're not going to incur any more debt. In fact, we're going to begin to lower the debt. But to do that, we will have to constrain ourselves in some way to rein in our appetite for spending. One of the ways to do that, that almost passed about, um, well, just a few years ago in, in the Senate here, I've forgotten the year we voted on it, but it failed by one vote, and that's the balanced budget amendment. And a lot of people think a balanced budget amendment would be a good way for Congress to tie our hands so that we just cannot spend more than we take in. So every single Republican has co-sponsored a balanced budget amendment. We hope that we'll get a lot of support from our friends on the other side of the aisle as well, because it clearly would require the federal government to live within its means each year, just as most American families have to do. There's also something that I believe is also uh, a, a very, very good idea, and that's a constitutional spending limit. In other words, you don't have to require that the budget is balanced if you limit spending to, in this case, 18% of the gross domestic product. The advantage of that is that there will be a desire on the part of everyone who wants to spend more money to have a more robust economy because every percentage of growth or every dollar of growth in the gross domestic product means more money you can spend at the federal government level. So I would imagine if we want to spend more money at the federal government level, we'll be supporting regulatory policies that don't uh, wipe out uh, whole industries like the coal industry. We'll, we'll support tax policies that promote pro-growth, that try to keep tax rates at a lower level and not punish companies um, here in the United States so they have to move operations abroad and so on. In other words, there are things we can do to promote economic growth. That means we have a bigger GDP, and if you have a bigger GDP, then uh, you can spend more money at the federal government level. But if you don't have a bigger GDP, then you can't. It's, we, we can only spend 18% 18 of the GDP under this proposal. And that, by the way, is about the historic average of what we have spent. Uh, in the in last uh, year and a half, unfortunately, we're, we've gone way above that. We're spending uh, around 22 percent of GDP. It's going up to 24 or 25 percent, and that's not sustainable, as almost everyone agrees. Another idea that is uh, sponsored by Senators Corker and McCaskill, a Republican and a Democrat, um, is the they call it the CAP Act, and that CAP Act would cap both mandatory and discretionary spending. It would put all government spending, in other words, on the table. It wouldn't just take the discretionary spending that we're talking about tonight to keep the government funded. We would also include all of the other spending. Beginning in the year 2013, the CAP Act would establish federal spending limits that over 10 years would reduce spending to 20.6 percent of the gross domestic product. Now, calculated a little differently, that is uh, uh, an average of the last 40 years of spending. And um, it, what it would do is create a glide path by which we could gradually reduce the spending so that you don't have to do it all at once. I mean, the reality is if we try to be too strong here in the way we're going to reduce spending, we're not going to be successful because people just won't stand for it. You've already seen the debate today and yesterday. Oh, my goodness, you're going to cut money from this and that. We can't do that. There will always be resistance to reducing spending. And so it's got to be done, in my view, I think, and, and both Senators Corker and McCaskill agree, it has to be done in a way that members will agree to each year, uh, rather than simply deciding this is too hard, we're going to give up. And of course, since it's only statutory, we could give up. By, we could waive it by 60 votes and say, too hard, we're going to give up. So it has to be at levels that are, are tough, but over a 10-year period, gradually, we can reduce. It's a little bit like going on a diet. You didn't get the weight you have overnight, and you're not going to lose it overnight. It makes more sense to do it in a way that keeps you healthy, keeps a consensus around here, but for sure gets us to the goal that we want to be on so that our kids and grandkids don't have to pay for all of the things that we have purchased. So. Um, this CAP Act, by the way, has a lot of good provisions like a uh, definition of emergency spending so that we can't game it. Every year when we decide we want to spend more, we just say, well, this is emergency spending, and then we don't have to include it in our other calculations. 
Um, I'd like to see more dramatic reductions. I know other people would too, but as I said, this is the kind of uh, really mainstream proposal that should attract a lot of attention, I think, on both sides of the aisle. Now, these are just three ideas, the balanced budget amendment, the constitutional spending limit, and this statutory cap act. There are a lot of other good ideas, and we, frankly, are going to have to have a good debate about what those ideas are, because I will predict that there's no way that debt ceiling is going to be increased without Congress adopting some of these constraints and the President signing those into law so that we'll know that in the future we don't have to keep raising the debt ceiling. Um, the last point I'd like to make, Mr. President, is that there are really two big reasons why we're trying to reduce the deficit. First, we all know we just can't keep spending what we're spending. The interest on the national debt in, uh, in a little over 10 years is going to approach a trillion dollars a year. It's over $200 billion this year. It'll be close to $250 billion next year. And it keeps going up about $60, $80 billion a year to the point that in the, in the uh, tenth year, it's 900 and some billion dollars. Well, think about that. You want to spend money on education? You want to spend money on health care? You want to spend money on defense? Sorry, we have to spend it on interest on our national debt. This is money we're paying to the Chinese or to anybody else that happened to purchase American debt. But it's going to crowd out spending in other areas that we really want to spend money on. That's not good. And as a result, we've got to get this spending under control while we still have an opportunity. But there's a second reason that it's so important. And that is that the more money, in effect, sucked up by governments, and that includes the federal government, the more money out of the economy that the federal government demands, the less money there is for private sector growth and investment. And it is, of course, in the private sector where most of the new jobs are created. And that's why we need to leave more money in the private sector. We're not reducing federal spending in order to engage in some big austerity uh, uh, program to try to uh, punish people uh, by, by providing less for them and so on. We're doing it to create more prosperity. The whole idea is prosperity. Mr. President, could I uh, just uh, ask an assent for a couple more minutes? Of, of oh, without objection. Thank you. Um, in other words, the idea here is to spend less money at the federal government level thereby allowing more for the private sector to invest in job creation, thereby growing the economy, making us a more wealthy nation, and, uh, and helping our families and job creators in the process. Um, I have cited a Wall Street Journal uh, op-ed many times, Mr. President, and I will, I will close with this. It's an op-ed that uh, was written by Gary Becker, um, uh, George P. Schultz, former secretaries of uh, he was secretary of three things, including Treasury, and um, John Taylor, who is a, uh, a Stanford economics professor. They, they wrote this op-ed in the Wall Street Journal, and uh, I'll just quote uh, two short paragraphs. They start out by saying, wanted a strategy for economic growth, full employment, and deficit reduction, all without inflation. They say experience shows how to get there. Credible actions that reduce the rapid growth of federal spending and debt will raise economic growth and lower the unemployment rate. Higher private investment, not more government purchases, is the surest way to increase prosperity. When private investment is high, unemployment is low. Above all, they say, the federal government needs a credible and transparent budget strategy. It's time for a game changer a budget action that will stop the recent discretionary spending binge before it gets entrenched in government agencies. And they conclude by saying, we need to lay out a path for total federal government spending growth for the next year and later years that will gradually bring spending into balance with the amount of tax revenues generated in later years by the current tax system. Assurance that the current tax system will remain in place pending genuine reform in corporate and personal income taxes will be an immediate stimulus. Mr. President, I think this is an excellent strategy for uh, a long-term growth policy. It's predicated on the fact that Congress will work in the short term, i.e. tonight, to 
reduce the spending for the remaining six months of this fiscal year. We'll then begin work on a budget that will reduce spending over the course of the next 12 months. And in the context of the debt ceiling debate, we'll also act on other programs to constrain government spending. It could be a balanced budget amendment, a constitutional spending limit, the CAP Act that I talked about, or any other idea that people can bring to the Senate and House floors and get passed here to begin to constrain the spending, not just so that we'll have the money to spend on in the government on the things that we want to do, but also so that we can free up the great energy of the private sector so that investment can once again flow, people can be hired, we can have economic growth and a real sense of prosperity in this country in the years to come. That's the challenge that we face after the agreement is reached tonight. Mr. President, I know you share my hope that a, an agreement will soon be announced and that we can then move on to the other items that I'm talking about here this evening. President, Senator from the great state of Colorado. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I rise tonight, as so many of my colleagues have through this uh, long day, to urge all of us to join together to prevent a uh, government shutdown. Uh, we've all expressed a growing amount of frustration here with what uh, I would characterize as politics as usual under the dome of this great capital in which we're so fortunate to serve. But it sure seems like uh, these are the kind of politics where the goalposts get continually moved and no amount of civility can seemingly overcome the impasse that is unfolding down the corridors in the House of Representatives. Now, I know the presiding officer operates in this way and the American public operates in this way, and they expect us to work together. They expect us to pass an appropriations bill that funds our government. But it appears like some unrelated policy writers that aren't about appropriating money but are about setting policy, that they're, they're leading to an impasse that could lead to an unnecessary and costly shutdown of government operations and services. Last night, I, I don't know where the presiding officer was, but my, my colleague, uh, Senator Bennett, was down here, and he highlighted, highlighted how petty the situation's become. He's, he pointed out that if you and I went to Applebee's for dinner tonight, and we had a $20 dinner for two, and then we had a fight over the bill, we'd be fighting over four cents. Well, I have some news. It looks like today we've got an agreement. We reached on the actual numbers. But now the House wants to add some controversial policy riders into the mix. It's as if that same check arrived when we were at Applebee's, and after having finally agreed on who's going to pay the four cents, we're now arguing over whether our, the waitress, uh, who's a hardworking American, should receive health care. I just, I got to say, I think people are watching this, they're, they're scratching their heads. I sure am. And we all face an impending government shutdown. And uh, as I've said, some members seem to want to inject very controversial policy issues into the debate. These issues have divided us for too many years. We ought to have that debate elsewhere, though. And I, it's really forcing this uh, shutdown uh, on the American people. Um, I've got to tell you that some people who are standing their ground think that they're doing something about our deficits. Now, bring our long-range fiscal picture has become. But what's equally frustrating is the disservice that's being done to the American public by this current debate that we're in. Not only will we be taken off the beat from addressing our real fiscal imbalances, which would be the budget debate we need to have on the 2012 budget, or on the longer-term challenge that the Simpson-Bowles Commission pointed out, but we're now being asked to litigate 
women's health issues. We ought to be focusing on supporting economic development and job growth. I don't understand it. We have a tentative agreement to cut billions from current spending levels, but the Speaker of the House seems to continue to demand that we ought to focus on non-budget issues. These are hot-button issues. Why would we insert them into an unrelated budget debate when there's so much at stake? It's, it's beyond me. I understand we want to show the American people we're serious about deficit reduction. I am. I know you are. I know the American people are. But in Colorado, people see straight through this latest ploy to inject non-budgetary issues into the debate. It's politics as usual. Mr. President, I know we've felt a little better recently. We've had 13 straight months of private sector growth. We've added 1.8 million jobs during that time frame. But our economy is still really fragile. And way too many Americans, way too many West Virginians, way too many Coloradans are struggling. And I have no doubt that a government shutdown at this time would have a counterproductive effect on our recovery. You don't just have to take my word for it. I'm a senator from Colorado. But listen to what top business leaders of all political persuasions are saying. The Business Roundtable president, John Engler, former governor of Michigan, Republican governor, said businesses would face the dangerous unintended consequences. Where interest rates could rise because of a shutdown and you'd have turmoil in our financial markets. Forecasters at Goldman Sachs have warned that a shutdown could shave off growth in our GDP every single week. CEOs of all, all stripes all over the country have warned about the shutdown's impact on confidence in the U.S. economic recovery. The presiding officer and I know, <clears throat> and senators from all across the country, that confidence is what we need. That's what's really lacking in many respects. And a shutdown would actually prevent the growth we tangibly need to address our long-term growth and fiscal balance. In other words, if we get the economy growing again, we'd have more tax revenues, and we'd see that gap between what we're spending and bringing in narrow. And I can't help but think, uh, in the context of this debate about my uncle, Stuart Udall, I know uh, I've talked to the presiding officer about the important role his father and men like his father played uh, in his upbringing and his values and his public service commitment. But Stuart Udall, my, my uncle, father, of my cousin, Senator Tom Udall from New Mexico, he wrote a book called The Forgotten Founders that focused on the settling of the West. And I bet it would apply as well to West Virginia. The, the theme of the book was on how the West was settled, how it was built. And he made a strong case in his book that the people that came out west were not looking to get into gunfights or range wars, regardless of what the Hollywood movies would suggest. They were wanting, wanting to start a new life in a new country, pursue what we now call the American dream. My Uncle Stuart pointed out when you watch those Hollywood movies, it was the people standing on the board sidewalks watching the mythical gunfight that were really the people who built the West. They were looking to work together. They weren't looking to get into fights. They were looking out for each other. It didn't matter what your political party was. And it feels to me like the American people today are standing on those board sidewalks, watching the same senseless gunfights and range wars are our equivalent of them right now here in Washington, D.C. But these are the people that matter. These are the people that will ultimately be hurt and affected by a shutdown. Now, I know I was hired by the people in Colorado and sent to the United States Senate. I was hired to come here and work together and solve some very difficult challenges facing this country. And that's today, why today I introduced the Preventing a Government Shutdown Act of 2011. Now, this bill was originally a Republican idea, and it's meant to ensure <clears throat> that the American people are not unfairly subjected to the effects of a government shutdown, simply because some members of Congress want to make a political point and pursue a persistent squabbling over the budget. The bill would ensure that federal appropriations continue at last year's funding levels as a bridge to keep the government running until a compromise could be reached for the remainder of a fiscal year. And then once Congress is able to reach a bipartisan agreement to fund the government for that fiscal year, then the automatic funding under my proposal would stop and it would be replaced by the enacted bill. 
Now, I know there are some who would say, well, wait a minute, the uh, Congress is charged with passing appropriations bills that reflect strategic planning, current functional needs, and create stability. What I'm suggesting that preventing a government shutdown act would do, it would create a safety valve that would ensure that partisan shutdown politics don't punish the American people and destabilize our economy going forward. Seems like a vocal minority wants to be combated, almost for the sake of being combated. Let's just fight for the sake of fighting. But in this case, in these delicate and fragile economic times, boy, that's, that's not a helpful thing to do, to put it mildly. So I think the mature thing to do would be to have a piece of legislation in place that would eliminate that kind of irresponsible behavior moving forward. Now, uh, Mr. President, I, as I come to close, I just have to think the American people are, are amazed at this, if they have time, because they're, they're busy providing for their families. And we've got to settle down here. We've got to act like adults. We need to work collaboratively toward a real budget solution. Yeah, we've got to re reduce our debt and deficits. The presiding officer has been on the point as well in this. But nobody find anybody more committed than me to that cause. But let's reach it in a way that protects our senior citizens, our veterans, our students, our border security. I could go on with a long, long list of important functions the federal government provides. But let's do it in a way that slashes spending but doesn't harm our fragile economic recovery or divert our attention on the divisive social issues. We can't afford a government shutdown. We just can't flat out afford a government shutdown. I will be disappointed to say the least, if the bipartisan deal that's before us, it's in our hands, is undercut by contentious, unrelated issues that only serve to divide us rather than bring us together. Now, I know one thing we can agree on is that our military personnel deserve better than this. We have young people fighting in two wars as I speak. We have young men and women serving all over the globe in over 50 countries. You and I know that we serve on the Armed Services Committee. And the last thing our soldiers, our sailors, our airmen, our Marines need us to worry about whether they're going to be able to pay their bills. Military families have already done more than their share, and now we're asking them to do even more. And that's simply unacceptable, Mr. President. I know we can find a solution to this particular situation. We work together in the Senate with Senator Hutchison and a bipartisan group of senators to introduce the Bipartisan Ensuring Pay for Our Military Act. This bill, Senate Bill 724, would ensure that our military service members would not have interrupted pay in the event of a shutdown, and we need to pass that bill if we don't get the job done tonight. Three days ago, I wrote a letter and I was joined by close to 18 of my colleagues, including the presiding officer, to Mr. Boehner. I know Speaker Boehner well. He and I served in the House together. And I urged him to work with all of us to avoid a shutdown. I'll stay here all the rest of this day, all night, whatever it takes. So I'm, I'm here to urge all of us, both chambers. Let's sit down together. Let's reason together. Let's use common sense together. Let's find a compromise. That's the American way. I know that's why I was elected to the Senate. People in Colorado know I work across party lines. The Senate of the United States could set that example right here tonight. We have numerous examples of us working together across party lines. So I just, I had to come to the floor tonight. I know the night's growing on, but I, I just had to come down here and urge senators in this great body, the world's greatest deliberative body, to find a common sense compromise to keep our government funded keep our economy focused upon and move our country forward. That's job one. Mr. President, thank you for your attention. Thank you for your willingness to work with me and spirit in which you serve West Virginia. Mr. President, I yield the floor and I note the absence of a quorum. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Akaka.
I was governor of West Virginia, we used to gravel over the budget like every state, every governor and every legislature, every senator and every delegate. Uh, but when the deadline arrived, uh, people came together and we did our job. Democrats and Republicans, business and labor, progressives and conservatives, and we enacted a balanced budget every year without failure. It's our part of our constitution, it's who we are. I've only been in the U.S. Senate for five months, and I have never seen anything quite like this. Never could have imagined anything quite like this. But I see so much opportunity if we'll just start talking and working together. We're out spending our revenues by hundreds of billions of dollars every month. Hundreds of billions every month. They tell us that our revenue estimates will be about 2.2 billion this year, but our expenditures are expected to be over 3.7 billion. Now, I believe everybody that we speak to and everyone that's listening to us can understand that we've got a problem. But yet we're grappling over this tonight of a budget that should have been done six months ago. This is a budget crisis, it's not a social crisis. And to put all of this into the mix right now is wrong. Instead of all of us coming together, really Republicans and Democrats, with a common sense budget, compromise, we face a shutdown of the government, not over how much to cut, but over what social issues we agree or disagree on. On many of these social issues, I will be the first to admit that I'm probably more conservative than most on my side of the aisle. I'm pro-life and I'm proud of it. But this is a budget crisis and I've said that. This is not the place or the time for that. There will be a time and a place to vote on these issues, but not when they jeopardize the paychecks of our brave men and women in uniform, which you just so eloquently explained what was at, at risk. And that is wrong. You know it's wrong, and we all know it's wrong, no matter what side of the aisle. Our dear friend, our senator from Arkansas, uh, was speaking about the cooperation that we all should have reaching out across the aisle uh, not putting blame, uh, and, and because we're all at fault. And we'll all be looked at as the culprits. The bottom line is, is that we need to come together and fix this. The American people expect that from us. The people back home in Colorado and also in West Virginia expect that from you and I. And it's right, what's right for the nation. That's one of the reasons that I and so many of my colleagues here have said that we're going to give up our salary. Uh, we call it the no work, no pay uh, pledge. That no work, no play pledge is pretty much universally understood. In West Virginia, when you don't have a good day's work, you shouldn't expect a payday. Uh, now, I can say that's not my fault. And you can say it's not your fault, and everybody else could, but we're all part of this. And we've got to put the pressure on. But I can tell you, as my father would tell me all the time, he said, Joe, whatever your problems are, try it without a paycheck. You'll compound them rapidly. I'm going to be sending my paycheck back to the U.S. Treasury to pay down our debt. Many others will be donating them to charity. We'll be standing with the American people, our military men and women, who will pay a heavy price for their elected government's failure to finish a budget. 
unless a common sense agreement is reached tonight, and I believe it will be. As we have a few hours, precious hours left, and I still am a very optimistic person. And with that, I think that there is some of our colleagues set up tonight about passing a piece of legislation, even if we don't come to agreement, that our brave men and women who are serving all over the world to protect us, to live in freedom, will be paid. To my friends on the Republican side of the aisle, I want to say that there are many instances where we might agree on social issues and some where we might disagree. That's the healthy part of our democracy. It's really what makes us so unique. I assure you, there is a time and a place for everything. There is a time and a place for those votes, but not tonight. Today is not that time, and our deadline is here and rapidly approaching, as you can see. My hope and prayer is that tonight we will do what's right. We'll come together as Americans, and we'll agree to a common-sense budget that is the first step to putting our fiscal house back in order. That's what the people of West Virginia who sent me here. And I took that oath of office not just to represent the Democrats on my side of the party or the Democrats in West Virginia. I took an oath of office to represent everybody in West Virginia, Democrats, Republicans, all different walks of life. And I'm going to do everything I can to make sure they understand I'm here for them. And I thank you. And I would say the absence of a quorum at this time, sir. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Akaka.
unanimous consent, the period for morning business for debate only be extended until 10.30 p.m., with senators permitted to speak for up to 10 minutes each, with the majority leader to be recognized at 10.30 p.m. Is there objection? Without objection, so ordered. Thank you.